Joyce Levine is an astrologer and author of books on astrology. What does an astrologer do? What an astrologer does is give people a better understanding of themselves, why they are the way they are, and what they can do with that in life. What kind of knowledge does an astrologer need to have? There's really a wide body of knowledge that you have to learn to, to be able to interpret what the planets mean. So you have to know the meanings of the planets in terms of how they affect human nature. And what skills do you have to have? One, you have to be good with people. When a person walks in my door, I've never seen them before. And in two hours, I'm going to tell them very personal things about themselves. So I have to be able to establish a rapport. Um, I have to be not intimidating because some of, the, some of the information that I give them may be hard to listen to. And so you need a sense of compassion. You need counseling skills. And if you're going to be self-employed, you need business skills. What do you do when somebody comes to see you? Before I see someone, I calculate their chart, which is based on their date, their time, and their place of birth. And then when they come in for or an appointment, what we do is basically go over what that means. What can a birth chart or horoscope tell you about a person? A person's chart shows their temperament, their personality, their character, their family background, how they're likely to work or spend money, the kind of people they're attracted to in life, what their relationships are like, and you know what their aspirations are. Can a person's chart predict their future? Within a range, yes. Um, life is cycles, and those cycles are predictable. And there's an intersection between fate and free will. So your chart is what you're like. Now you have a range of possibilities. You can be the best of yourself or the worst of yourself. The cycles themselves are basically predictable. And then human beings have... Why do people usually come to see you? Typically, the first time someone comes in, they have some kind of problem or they've hit some kind of obstacle. People don't usually come in the first time because they're happy or they're curious. They've, they've either lost a job or they, they want to make a change and they're not sure what to do or they're having some kind of relationship difficulty and they want to understand what's going on in their life, how they got there, and, and basically what they can do about it. What kind of people come to see you? The clients I have really are a wide range of people. On one hand, I, you know, I work with I work with individuals, I work with couples, I work with families, and I work with businesses. And so a mother might call me because a baby was just born and she wants to have the baby's chart done. For relationship consultations, a couple might come in and say, you know, we're having difficulties and I can work with businesses. You know, are you more likely to make money this year? Are there gonna, will you have problems with employees? When's a good time for hiring? If you saw on someone's chart something bad about their future, would you tell them? If I saw something that could be a serious problem, I would tell someone, but I would tell them in such a way, ideally, that it's not going to particularly frighten them. So I would say, you know, maybe it's a, given your cycles, this is probably a good time for a checkup. You know, you want to make sure that your health is okay. Or there could be some health problems in the family, you know, you might want to spend more time with your mother or something like that. Ideally, I wouldn't scare them, but they'd get the message. Do you ever look at your own future? Of course, you can't help it. It's, I mean, I always know where the planets are, and so I always know what's affecting me. What's your star sign? My star sign is Aquarius. Do you ever read your horoscope? I do, actually. I start most of my mornings with my horoscope, surprisingly. Do you think someone's star sign has an influence on their personality? I think it's what you read into it. I mean, it's, it's fun stuff, so it's entertaining. I don't think you should take it too seriously. What's your star sign? My what? Your star sign. Leo. Yes. Do you ever read your horoscope? I do every once in a while, but uh, I don't really like to listen to what it says because it's usually crazy. Do you think someone's star sign has an influence on their personality? 
Um, I maybe if that's something they grow up reading a lot, I might. I think it might kind of influence you if uh, if you read it, and maybe that would influence you by reading it often. So. What's your star sign? Sagittarius. Do you ever read your horoscope? No, hardly. <laughs> Do you think someone's star sign has an influence on their personality? Um, I guess it might do, but I would say probably where you grow up and the people you talk to have a bigger influence on how you turn out. What's your star sign? Uh, I'm a Cancer, the moody emotional sign. Do you ever read your horoscope? Once in a while, um, not too often. If I'm flipping through a magazine and it has them, I'll, I'll read it. But you know, I don't go out of my way every day to find my horoscope and read it. No. Do you think someone's star sign has an influence on their personality? Yeah, I do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't necessarily want to admit that, but yeah, I do. What is your star sign? I'm a Taurus. Do you ever read your horoscope? Um, no, I don't ever read my horoscope because I once took a course in psychology and um, we kind of got a little bit of insight into how horoscopes are developed and how generalizable they are to different people. So often you read them and they do apply, however, they might apply to several other people as well. Do you think someone's star sign has any influence on their personality? Um, from things that I've read about astrology, a lot of times you can find things that, you know, relate to people's, like, personality characteristics that relate to their sign. However, I personally think, again, it's more like a generalizable sort of thing. Heidi Evans is a flight attendant for JetBlue a discount airline. What made you want to be a flight attendant? I actually saw a movie about a flight attendant and it looked like something I could do. It looked very exciting, traveling around the world, meeting new people, going to different destinations. What kind of training did you have? We had an extensive training, four weeks down in Orlando. We did a lot of work on the cabin simulators. We did a lot of emergency situations, a lot of safety drills to make sure we were prepared if something ever would occur, but we would need to use our emergency situation skills for. We learned how to deal with many different situations, safety related, we learned CPR, we learned how to use the defibrillator, we learned how to deal with situations where people are afraid to fly, where people don't want to be on the airplane anymore, or they are sick. What kind of person do you think the airlines are looking for? Someone who is happy, energetic, loves to fly, loves to be at their job. They don't really want to hire somebody that's going to be cranky and doesn't want to be there. They're looking for someone with good customer service skills. They're looking for someone who's patient, someone who's willing to go the extra mile, someone who's willing to work with other people. What are the good sides of being a flight attendant? There are a lot of good perks to being a flight attendant. You get to travel for free. You can go visit the country, which I take advantage of many times. There's no office. There is an office, it's the plane, but it changes every day. My destinations change, the people on the plane change, which is exciting because I get to meet a whole slew of people that are new, it's different, and it's great. That's a great perk for me. And what are the bad sides? There aren't that many bad sides. The few you could think of probably would be the delays, the sitting, waiting, but that doesn't happen as much as people think. There's also red-eye flights, which is flying throughout the night, through the whole night, and you're up all night and you have to get in and you get very exhausted. It takes a toll on your body, so you pretty much sleep the rest of the day when you get home. What tips do you have for someone going on a long flight? Before you go on a long haul red-eye flight through the night, I suggest you sleep in the morning before. Make sure you get plenty of rest, drink lots of water. Always a good thing to do is exercise before and actually while you're on the flight, take walks through the aisles, stretch your legs, stretch your calves, drink plenty, plenty, plenty of water. You must come into contact with a lot of passengers who are afraid of flying. How do you deal with this? Usually we just ask, are you okay? Do you have a question? Do you need something? And usually it's, what's that noise? What's that bump? What's going on? And calm them down, talk to them. They usually, once they get their questions answered, they're usually pretty good. How can you tell if someone's scared? You can see it in their face. 
you can see them clenching their fists under the armrest. Their eyes are shut tightly. They're making the scared face. Have you ever been in a dangerous situation? Yes, I have. We were taking off out of New York, and as we were taking off, we started to smell smoke. We looked around, and you could actually see little bits of smoke coming through the cabin. And that moment, we called the captain, and we told him we smell smoke. There is smoke in the cabin. And at that point, he got on the phone with the ground people to make an emergency landing. The flight attendants got up. We walked through the cabin. We looked, calmed the people down. We told them they were, everything was going to be fine. We got back in our seats. We landed the plane, got the people off the plane safely. Everyone worked together. Nobody got hurt, thankfully. And that was that. We ended up getting another plane, taking off, and landing at our destination just fine. How do you feel when you fly? Uh, I feel pretty good once I'm in the air. Taking off and landing is sometimes a little nerve-wracking, but otherwise fine. What do you least like about flying? Uh, probably my least favorite part about flying is waiting in long lines, whether it's for the bathroom or check-in or for luggage. Have you ever had a frustrating experience when you were flying? Yes, certainly. I mean, I think we all have. Uh, there was a time in Chicago when I had to wait on the runway for about four hours, and they kept telling us that we'd be taking off any moment, and that never happened, and finally we got sent to a hotel and didn't get out to the next day. How do you feel when you fly? When I fly, I love to fly. I think it's so exciting. <laughs> what do you least like about flying? Um, I get bored after, like in the third hour. <laughs> Towards then, start getting bored. Have you ever had a frustrating experience when you were flying? Um, oh geez. Off the top of my head, that's pretty hard. I don't know. How do you feel when you fly? Um, I'm not the easiest flyer. I feel a little bit nervous, especially about takeoff and landing. What do you least like about flying? Landing. <laughs> I tend to feel a little bit sick when I land, so you know, nausea and kind of being uncomfortable and wanting to get off the plane right away. Have you ever had a frustrating experience when you were flying? Flying? Hmm. I can't think of anything offhand, but there has been a time, there have been times before where we've been stuck waiting to get off the plane for over an hour and a half without being able to get up. So that was pretty frustrating, but aside from that, no. How do you feel when you fly? I, I get kind of nervous when I'm flying on planes. It's just one of my fears. What do you least like about flying? Flying, uh, the turbulence, it's, it's one of the scariest things. And uh, just the, the stuff you see on the news, planes crashing, it's not something you want to do. Have you ever had a frustrating experience when you were flying? Uh, I had one bad experience when I was flying. We were going to Puerto Rico. I was about 12 years old. Um, the weather was terrible, the turbulence was awful, the plane dropped about 60 feet and I, I just started bawling my eyes out. I had my younger brother right next to me, about four years old, and telling me it's going to be alright. And here I am, the big guy, the, the oldest of the family, uh, crying my eyes out. Easy is a free runner who started the organization Urban Free Flow. Free runners use obstacles in a town or city to create movement by running, jumping, and climbing. Can you do free running anywhere? I mean, for example, if you're on your way somewhere? Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, you could, you could kind of, you know, do it anywhere, you know, and uh, if you're on your way to work, you could do it. But generally, the people who practice would go to a particular spot and practice there and then move on elsewhere. Where do you most enjoy doing free running? Um, the most rewarding for me would be running in London, here. I mean, around the South Bank, and we do it in a team of maybe ten of us, and just, just you know, like uh, you know, someone leading the way and, and the rest following, and just using basic obstacles like lampposts and walls and just moving. How did you first get into free running? Well, my background is in boxing, um, which I did for about 20 years, and I boxed at the international level. And I got married and had a kid, and had to just change my life around and become sensible all of a sudden. So I, I gave up the boxing, and there was a huge void in my life. So I drifted into martial arts, which didn't really do it for me. And I was looking for the next thing to do. And I saw this on TV one day. And um, I remember sitting in bed watching it, and I said, that, that's what I'm looking for. Tell us about the organization Urban Free Flow. Well, Urban Free Flow started out as a website. 
Um, but then we, we, we devised a, um, a performance team. We have 20 athletes in the team now, eight who are very, very high profile. Um, we're sponsored by Adidas now. Um, you know, we take care of all sorts of commercials and movies in that sense. We teach as well, we teach in schools, we've uh, taught the army, the police. How do you help the police? The police run um, these, these schemes for youth offenders and they're trying to get them out of you know, doing bad things. So it's, it's seen as a positive thing to do, it's seen as a very cool thing to do. And, um, and, and for the youth it's very engaging, so that's what we do for them. And how does it help schools? In terms of schools, the same again, the, the, there's a big problem in the UK with obesity and kids that just aren't practicing anything, they're not, not doing any PE, they're not doing any kind of sport. Whereas what we do is perceived as being very cool and unwittingly they're taking part and, and exercising. So that seems to be a very positive thing. How dangerous is free running? On the face of it, what we do seems to be quite dangerous, but that's it doesn't touch on what we do. We're very, very uh, safety conscious. We work in movies, commercials, where safety is paramount. I mean, everything we do is calculated. There's no risk taking. You know, if you see a big jump being done, we'd have practiced that at ground level thousands of times over and over and over. I think if anything, the key word for what we do is repetition. What attracted you to free running? Was it the risk element? To a degree, the, the risk element played a part, but it was more about the, um, the sense of freedom. The, the way to be able to move within your environment with no limitations. You know, you don't need any equipment to take part, no skateboard or no BMX, you can just a pair of trainers and I'm, I'm ready to go. That was the, the real draw for me, just the freedom aspect. Have you had many accidents since you started doing free running? Well, if, if you're practicing this sport, you will pick up, you know, the odd scrapes here and there. You, know, you, you get blisters on your hands and calluses, which is, which is normal. You might get the odd sprained ankle. Personally, I um, fell out of a tree once and fell on my head which wasn't, <laughs> wasn't very nice, and I had to go to a hospital here. Is free running really something that anyone can do? It helps if you have a background in, in some kind of sport, but it isn't essential. You can start from being a complete beginner. Um, gymnastics would help, but you could be you know, just someone who plays football or does a bit of running and, um, and pick it up straight away. You know, as long as you start out very small scale and take your time, you know, there's no problem. Have you ever done any high-risk sports or activities? Uh, yeah, I uh, raced cars for 20 years before I got married and had children and that quickly ended. <laughs> what was it like? Uh, it, what, it's what I did since I was 10 years old. Um, it was probably where I felt most comfortable behind the wheel of a race car. Um, it was a rush, it was a lifestyle that I enjoyed, it took me around the world, um, so it was, yeah, it was, it was what I wanted to do for a long time. Is there anything else you'd like to try? Uh, <laughs> I would probably have a few, my wife I'm not sure <laughs> she'd be excited about. Uh, parachuting probably, jumping out of an airplane. My parents both did it and uh, I was supposed to get it for my 18th birthday and I never followed up on it with them, so we'll see, someday, someday. Have you ever done any high-risk sports or activities? High-risk, hmm, depends on how you defined it. I've done bungee jumping, I've done skydiving, I've done scuba diving. Um, next month I'm going to try out rock climbing, so I guess those are pretty extreme sports. <laughs> what was skydiving like? Skydiving is probably one of my favorite things to do. Um, it's just the adrenaline rush where it only lasts seconds, but you know, I did that several years back and I still remember, recalled how that feels to actually jump out of a plane. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to try? Um, I think I would want to give sky, um, scuba diving a chance again. I ruptured my ear diving in the Great Barrier Reefs. So I, it hadn't been the same ever since so I've been a little bit scared to go back and try that out again, but it would be great to <laughs> give it another chance. Have you ever done any high-risk sports or activities? The only high-risk sport I've ever done would be jet skiing. What was it like? Just a total new experience for me and jumping up in the air of after huge waves was just awesome and kind of nerve-wracking at the same time. Is there anything else that you'd like to try? I cannot see myself doing any high-risk sports. I get too nervous and jumping out of a plane isn't for me.
Have you ever done any high-risk sports or activities? Um, after I turned 18, I did participate in a high-risk activity. I went skydiving. Um, my mom, especially at the beginning, was very hesitant to let me go, but I eventually convinced her, and it was one of the best things I've ever done in my entire life. What was it like? It was really like an out-of-body experience, I guess. Um, it was anything like unlike I've ever experienced before, and I would definitely recommend it to everyone. Is there anything else you'd like to try? Um, my dad goes whitewater rafting, and I've always wanted to try that with him. Um, so I would definitely love to get into whitewater rafting. Trevor White is a Canadian actor. Can you tell us a little bit about the kind of acting you do? Uh, there, there isn't much I, I don't do, I guess, um, as far as acting goes. Um, there's theater, obviously, um, film work, uh, television work, sometimes commercials, uh, and even voiceover work, where, which is uh, for radio or for television, or even sometimes animated shows where you lend your voice to those as well. So I, I've rarely said no to an acting job. Did you always want to be an actor? Well, it's something that I always love to do, act, uh, as a kid in, in high school and school plays and uh, uh, in, in my spare time just playing around with friends, you know, acting and, and improvising and, and that kind of thing. But I don't think I ever believed that I could or, or ever took it seriously to, to act as a profession um, or for the rest of my life. So uh, I went into university and took economics as a more practical thing to do, um, but I, I didn't really enjoy it, I guess, and, and, uh, and ultimately um, after university I, uh, I started taking some acting classes and uh, really enjoyed that, and um, then started doing student films and uh, fringe theater and unpaid work just to get experience in, in acting, and uh, loved it, and then started doing it more seriously and got an agent and started getting proper acting jobs, and, uh, and that was uh, about 13 years ago. What's the most difficult thing about preparing for a new role? Um, it really depends. When, when you do a play, for example, you have three, four, sometimes even six weeks to rehearse uh, with the other people and the director and the props and everything. So you have a long time to learn your lines, to, to as it were, find the character. The memorization is, is the most, like, real work. <laughs> That can be difficult, you know, just memorizing lots of lines. But uh, and in film and television, you don't have the benefit of rehearsal. You just show up and you're expected to know all your lines, and then you do it a few times, and that's it. Uh, so you you have to be very disciplined and get all that ready in advance. How do you learn your lines? Um, I have a uh, a dictaphone actually, <laughs> um, which I just record the other people's lines. Um, Obviously, in my voice, I don't do strange character voices because that would be weird. Uh, and, um, you know, I just say their line, I stop it, I say my line, I play the next line. So you just basically record all the other lines in any given scene and, uh, and play it back and, and just work through it slowly. Um, it's amazing the difference it makes when, you, when the writing is good and it makes sense. Uh, it's much easier to memorize, but if sometimes you, you audition for a, a bad science fiction TV show or a, or a horror movie or something, you often have a much harder time memorizing poorly written lines because they, well, they're just bad. But of course it's your job, so you do it. Is there any role you've particularly enjoyed? Um, there's, there's a few roles that I've played or, or oftentimes when you do something it's it's the whole experience of a job not necessarily just the part you have in it uh, earlier this year I got to work for the Royal Shakespeare Company for the first time and we did uh, Coriolanus one of Shakespeare's lesser performed plays uh, in Stratford in Washington in America uh, also in Newcastle here in the United Kingdom and in Madrid in Spain for five months, uh, which was amazing. What's the most difficult role that you've ever had to play? Well, I suppose this last role that I played is, is one of the most difficult 
parts, uh, Tullus Aphidius and Coriolanus, because there were lots of things that were very demanding about the part. We had to do a, a huge uh, sword and axe fight in the middle of the play, um, which I'd done stage combat before, but never anything like this. We were using actual, I mean, they were blunt swords and axes, but they were still very large pieces of metal. And we had a couple of small accidents, but no no major ones, luckily. Um, I gave the other guy three stitches on his fingers at one point when, when he parried in the wrong place. That's my opinion, anyway. Do you prefer working in the theater or in movies and TV? I think theater is the most satisfying work in acting oftentimes because you get to do it over and over again in front of a live audience, but it doesn't tend to pay as well as film and television, which is also fun, but not as glamorous as people might think it is, I guess. So being an actor isn't really glamorous? No, I don't think acting is a glamorous life, um, particularly in, well, I guess in any way. In theater, it's, you know, you don't really earn that much money, um, and you, you know, you work hard. Um, yeah, uh, and, and film and television work is, uh, you know, it can be a lot of fun. You can get to work with some famous people sometimes or some very talented people that you admire and that's a that's a thrilling thing and yeah you can sh you get to shoot guns or you know go on car chases and all those things are really fun but uh, most of the time the 90 percent of, of the day even when you're doing exciting things you're just sitting and waiting around you're always waiting around they're always fixing lights setting up new camera positions trying to figure out who's going where when and it, it's a you know, it takes them s f to film a proper, you know, feature film takes months, and maybe in all that time, only two or three of those days, all all told, is actually you doing anything. So, um, yeah, people. I think a lot of people get into extra work and stuff because they think, oh, this will be really glamorous. But you end up sort of reading a book about nine hours a day. Um, so, yeah, and I've never been on a red carpet, so I, I suppose. I can't judge. That looks glamorous. <laughs> Have you ever acted? Um, when I was in high school, I had to act in some plays for a drama class that I was in. So we did performances for the student body. How did it make you feel? It made me feel that I really wasn't meant to be an actor specifically, but it was a good experience and it was a start in public speaking, so that was valuable. Have you ever acted? I've done a little bit of acting. Um, I started a few years ago doing more serious work for more commercial print um, and commercials as well as independent films and a little bit of extra work on major motion pictures. How does it make you feel? I love doing acting. I think it's so much fun portraying a different person and it's just a ton of fun doing different projects. Have you ever acted, and what did you act in? Um, yes, I used to act um, in college musicals when I was at college, which is a long time ago now. How did it make you feel? Lots of fun. I love dancing, so I used to do lots of dancing when I was growing up, so it just was a continuation of that experience. Have you ever acted? Well, I, uh, I did some acting in high school. I did a couple of musicals my junior and senior years. Uh, one of them was Fiddler on the Roof. How did it make you feel? It was a lot of hard work, but I felt really great doing it. I was nervous at first when I got on stage, but it was pretty clear that the audience was enjoying themselves, and by the end when they're applauding, you feel fa fabulous. Have you ever acted? I acted once. It was uh, in one of my theater classes in high school. I was a sophomore, and we just made up our own play. And um, that, was, that was one of the premier highlights of my acting career, and one of the, one of the last highlights. <laughs> How did it make you feel? Uh, it was very nerve-wracking, because you had to remember all your lines, and you had an audience, which is something that I was always uh, terrified of. Sir Nicholas Kenyon was the director of a music festival in London called The Proms for 12 years. How did The Proms start? 
The Promenade concert started way back in 1895 when a brilliant impresario wanted to use a newly built concert hall in London, the Queen's Hall, for a series of popular concerts that really brought classical music to the widest possible audience. Uh, there were important classical concerts during the year, but in the summer people tended to go away, society life finished, and so he had the brilliant idea of taking away all the seats on the floor of the hall where the expensive people usually sat, and letting people come in and stand there and walk around and have a very informal experience of, of concert going. The name proms is an abbreviation of promenade concerts and it basically means that people are able to walk around uh, and stand during the music. How long do the proms last? The proms lasts for two months in the summer from the middle of July to the middle of September. And during that period, there's one concert every day, two concerts on many days, three concerts on, on some days. So it's a very, very intense period of music making. And people buy season tickets in order to be able to attend all the concerts, whether they do or, or not. Very few people attend actually all of them, except me. Uh, and they come and they queue during the day in order to get the best places in the floor of the hall where they stand. World-class musicians perform at the proms for much lower fees than they usually receive. Why do you think that is? I think the proms has an absolutely unique atmosphere. That's what orchestras and conductors who come here say. Um, and so people do want to come and perform. What you get at the proms is a wonderful mixture of total informality and total concentration. So that although people don't dress up to come to the proms, they behave how they want, they actually absolutely listen to the music. And that is a feature that so many conductors and orchestras really comment on. The level of concentration is absolutely amazing. There must have been many truly memorable concerts during your time as director of the proms. Could you tell us about one of them? Uh, the death of Princess Diana was particularly difficult because, of course, uh, she lived just across the road in Kensington Palace from where the proms happen in the Royal Albert Hall. We changed some programmes to make them more appropriate. On the day of her funeral, we put in Foray's Requiem to the programme. Very oddly, we had programmed uh, two or three requiems in that last two weeks of the season, and they fitted very, very well. We then lost uh, another major figure of the musical world, the conductor Sir George Schulte, who was to have conducted the Verdi Requiem on the last Friday of the season. And he, was in, he had been a very good friend of Princess Diana and indeed had rung me up just after Diana's death to say that he wanted to dedicate this Verdi Requiem to her memory. As it turned out, he died just a week later, and so another conductor, Colin Davis, took over that Verdi Requiem and dedicated it to both of them. And it was a fantastically charged atmosphere in the hall. I can't remember such an electric occasion as that. There was also another strange coincidence in the program at the time of Princess Diana's death in 1997, could you tell us about it? A wonderful American composer called John Adams had written an absolutely wonderful piece which we were going to do on the last night of the proms in 1997. Unfortunately, I mean, it could have been called absolutely anything, this piece. It's a whirling, abstract piece of fanfare music. Unfortunately, he had called it Short Ride in a Fast Machine. And so it was perfectly obvious from the first moment that we had to take that, pro that piece out uh, and change the programme. Are there any embarrassing or amusing experiences you remember? Well, one of the things that was a real challenge to the proms was the arrival of the mobile phone. Uh, because in the beginning, people didn't know how to use them, when to switch them off. Um, uh, and the Albert Hall is a very, very big space, and mobile phones would go off in concerts, and, and it could be very embarrassing. Usually, because they were in the middle of the music, conductors just ignored them. 
and people got embarrassed and switched them off. But there was one particular incident that was just so awful uh, because... Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring starts with a very, very exposed, quiet, bassoon solo, and Simon Rattle and the Berlin Philharmonic, making one of their first appearances together at the proms, had just begun that piece when a mobile phone went off very loudly in the stalls. And Simon Rattle uh, stopped the bassoonist and turned round and glared at this person in the stalls, and... <clears throat> there was a round of applause and everything. So anyway, that it restarted and the performance was a spectacular success and it was wonderful. But this was such a, an incident that he had actually stopped it that it became the subject of a lot of media attention and there were paragraphs in the papers. And I had to go and be interviewed the next day um, at home for a Radio 4 programme about mobile phones going off in concerts. And in the middle of this interview, my own phone went off. And it's a, very, it's a wonderfully classic little bit of tape. Uh, my embarrassment at the same thing happening to me. Have you ever been to a music festival? Uh, yes, I'm from Austin, Texas, and so I've been to the Kerrville Folk Festival and the uh, Austin uh, City Limits Music Festival. What are they like? Tell us about it. Um, the Kerrville Folk Festival is a little bit more laid back, and uh, it's beautiful country. It's out in the country, so it's uh, kind of a camping experience, a lot of fun, great food, and Austin City Limits, which is also called ACL, is usually very hot because it's in September, and it's urban and a lot of great music acts. Um, it's, I just remember it always being very hot. Have you ever been to a music festival? Yes, uh, the Lollapaloozas, way back. Not to date myself, but it was a while ago. <laughs> What was it like? Uh, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I was, I've was i been to probably 100 shows, and it was it was a fantastic one. And it had, the first couple had, you know, my favorite bands, uh, Jane's Addiction, um, Soundgarden early on. So all of those were sort of what I was listening to at the time, so it was perfect for me. It was great. Have you ever been to a music festival? Um, I've been to one huge music festival, um, which is called Earthfest, and it's one day of bands coming um, right along the water, and they play, and there's um, food concession stands and lots of people, so it's a lot of fun. Tell us more. What was it like? Uh, when we got there first, we picnicked a little bit. Um, during the morning and then in the afternoon we would walk around and there's a lot of companies that come and bring samples so we would walk around and sample the food and then we'd walk to the music, listen to some of the bands play and then just hang out there for the rest of the day. Have you ever been to a music festival? <laughs> yeah, I have been to the, uh, the Sounds of the Underground Festival which is a big national heavy metal tour. I took my 14-year-old uh, cousin. I think I was the oldest guy there. It was, it was, it was pretty fun. What was it like? Um, well, you know, I was, I was big into metal when I was young and his age and used to go to a ton of shows. So it was like being in that environment but now being just a little bit too old and it made me really uncomfortable. But the new bands are great and it was it was fun to watch the ones that had been around since I was into it still up there rocking out. Gramville is a conductor, or a tour guide, of Boston Duck Tours. The company uses vehicles called ducks that can travel on land or water. How did the Boston Duck Tours start? The company was founded by a fellow by the name of Andy Wilson. Uh, I believe 14 years ago. Uh, he was a fellow who was traveling about and he, he saw a duck being used, uh, I believe, on a tour. And he thought, oh, that would be great in Boston. We've got the Charles River, we've got all the historical sites. In your opinion, what makes a duck tour special? 
Boston Doctor is a special for, for two reasons, actually. One is that we actually, it's an amphibious tour. We go on the river. There's a wonderful view of Boston. But that and uh, the fact that there is levity in the, uh, in the tour, there's a good deal of sense of humor involved, and it, it works out very well. It's a special, special occasion. What are the most popular sites on the tour? The most popular sites are difficult to determine because different people have different interests. Uh, I think there's a, a high degree of interest in, the, uh, in Beacon Hill because uh, people have heard of Beacon Hill, the home of the, the double rich, our Boston Brahmins. Um, I think they're interested also in Fannel Hall, uh, which is where Sam Adams did his work uh, in the pre-revolutionary days. What would you say is the best thing about Boston for a tourist? For a tourist in Boston, I think the best thing is really the, uh, the friendliness of the city. It's a very friendly city, and it is also a safe city. To walk around downtown, uh, you are safe at any time of the night or day. It's really not a dangerous spot. Uh, so uh, those, I think, are the, the two best things about the city in general. And what is the worst thing? The worst thing about being a tourist in Boston is without question the matter of driving a car. Do not drive a car in Boston unless you live here and know your way around. It is an impossibility. The, uh, the streets are, are almost all of them one way. Sometimes you can run onto five, six, seven streets in a row that are all one way, the wrong way. And people who don't know their way around can get badly, badly lost. Have you had any interesting or amusing incidents during the tour that you can tell us about? There was one particularly funny, uh, funny instance that occurred. Uh, on rare occasions, we will get a passenger on board who is not aware that the tour is amphibious, that the ducks are intended to go into the river. And uh, I think it was two or three years ago, I had a family that had arranged a surprise birthday for their mother. Now, she was not a youngster. I mean, I would, have, I would guess she was probably in her 70s. And uh, we did the tour, and she was enjoying it, and she was, you know, obviously enjoying this birthday present from her children. We got to the river, and we have a ramp that goes down at a rather steep angle into the river. And uh, when you're on the ramp, there's that, that kind of roller coaster sensation of, oh, we're going down. And uh, at that point, I turned around, and uh, I could see on her face this look of what appeared to me to be excited glee. And it's not uncommon to, for people to shriek with glee, especially the children. Well, she was shrieking her brains out. And when we got onto the water, it became clear that she didn't know this tour was an amphibious tour. And she was, she was really freaking out. Do you tell any funny stories about the city, too? There is. There's a funny story about Boston Garden, our magnificent premier downtown sports arena where the Celtics reign supreme. The garden that we have now is the new garden, but it was preceded by the old, original Boston Garden, right in the very same location. And uh, they had a ghost. True story, they had a ghost in the old Boston Garden. The janitors came in to work one morning. They found rubbish strewn all over the floor where they'd cleaned up the night before after an athletic event. And they assumed that they'd had a vandal in the building, so they dismissed it. They weren't at all concerned. But the following morning, this rubbish shows up again. And the following morning, the following morning, well, make a long story short, days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months, and this rubbish keeps showing up. And these, these janitors are flummoxed by this. Months turn into years, and this keeps going on. And by this time, they're cemented in their mind. This, they have a ghost in the old Boston Garden. And when they tore down, the old building to replace it with the new garden. What did they find? This is a true story. They found the remains of a monkey. He'd escaped from the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus years ago. He'd been living in the rafters of Boston Garden for years, undetected. And I mean, if you've ever been to one of these sports arenas, you know there's tens of thousands of sports spectators, television sweeping every inch of the arena, and never once was that monkey ever detected. Can you imagine that? What's your favorite city in the world? My favorite city in the world would have to be Dublin in Ireland. Um, I was there two years ago with my friends and I've had, I had the most wonderful time. The people were awesome. The city was absolutely gorgeous. The weather could have been better because it rains all the time, but it was a lot of fun. What city would you most like to visit? I would love to go to Prague. Um, 
just because I've never been there and I've heard great things about it. So it's definitely one city that I would love to visit before I'm done. <laughs> What is your favorite city in the world? My favorite city in the world would have to be Miami. Uh, the reason being, the weather is beautiful, you can't complain. Um, my family, I have a lot of family that lives down there. The diversity down there, uh, it's a, a fast-paced lifestyle, and it's, it's just gorgeous. What city would you most like to visit? A city anywhere in the world that uh, would probably have to be Rome. And the reason being for that is it's just gorgeous out there. It's, it's different. I mean, it's, it's Europe. Everybody wants to go out there. It's beautiful. What's your favorite city in the world? Uh, my favorite city in the world would have to be Cambridge, Massachusetts, because I think it's really cute and everyone's really nice and it's like a perfectly sized city. What city would you most like to visit? Um, I think I'd like to visit Athens, Greece. I think it has a lot of historical uh, value, and I think it'd be very cool to see. What's your favorite city in the world? Favorite city in the world? Well, to be a little cliche, Paris. I, I went to when I was 17 or 18, and I always wanted to take someone special back there, and I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. My then-girlfriend, now-wife or then fiance, now wife, um, she and I get to go back there and spend about 10 days. And so that was, that was pretty neat. I really enjoyed that. What city would you most like to visit? Uh, probably, probably Tokyo. I was there for a day, but didn't get a chance. I kind of felt like I had an opportunity to see it and wasn't able to. So back there to see, to see it again or to see more of it would be great. Jesse Scheidlauer is one of the main editors of the Oxford English Dictionary, also known as the OED. Could you give us an estimate of how many new words come into the English language every year? It's very hard to give an exact number for the number of new words that enter the language in a given year. Uh, there's just no way to figure out which are really new words, which are going to stay around. Um, there are going to be words that come in very briefly but no one really pays attention to or people pay attention to only because they're new but they're not going to be a part of the language. Uh, the OED puts in around a thousand new words every year and that's a number with some meaning but it doesn't tell you anything about how large the language is or anything like that. But it is one useful figure you can look at. And how long does it usually take for a new word to get into the dictionary? There's no easy way to say exactly how long it will take for a new word to make it into the dictionary. Uh, in some cases, it can be very fast. If you have a term for something that's very important and you know it's important and there's a term uh, that describes that, uh, it can go in very quickly. Can you give us an example of a word that entered the dictionary very quickly? Typically, when you have a word that enters the dictionary very quickly, it's a technical term or something where you have a new invention and that becomes very popular very quickly and you know then that as soon as there's a word coined for that it's got to go in pretty quickly if the term is important enough and I think the best recent example is podcasting uh, where I think the first example we have from that is 2003 but it became so ubiquitous so quickly and this was the term for it. there was no other term there were no competing terms there were no other descriptions um, this was it um, and we waited a very short amount of time before saying, well, you know, even though this is very, very recent, um, this is clearly such a big thing that it has to go in right away. Another good example of a new word that came into the language very quickly is Google as a verb, uh, meaning to use the Google search engine to look for information on the Internet, uh, which you know, happened to have been coined very soon after Google started in uh, the late 1990s, uh, but because of how prominent Google is and how many people use it, um, it's all people use now. It's the word for searching for things on the Internet. You, know, you want to find out what something is, you Google it. How are new words formed? Um, there are a number of different ways that words can be formed in English. Uh, one of the most common ways is compounding, where you take two separate words and use them together in a particular way. Uh, for example, one of the recent entries in the OED uh, is the word hang time, uh, which refers to the amount of time that a, a ball kicked or thrown stays in the air, uh, or that a person jumping stays in the air, um, a relatively recent term in sports, uh, which is formed from taking two words and using them together. Uh, another example is time shift, 
uh, which is typically used to refer to uh, video recording or you know, digitally recording a television show so that you can watch it at a later time, so just shifting the time you're watching it. Are there also new words that come from other languages? There are a number of words that enter the OED from foreign languages all the time. Hawala, a term from Arabic, which refers to an informal system of uh, a sort of an informal banking system where people pay you know, debts on behalf of other people in different places. Uh, ki, uh, K-I, which is a Japanese term uh, for sort of you know, a life force or a strong you know, force of nature. It's the equivalent of uh, chi in Chinese. Are there any interesting stories about new words entering the dictionary? One of the famous stories in the history of the OED is that when uh, the OED was first being the very earliest uh, stages when they were working the letter A, um, it was decided to keep the word um, appendectomy and appendicitis out of the dictionary because these were thought to be you know, too technical. And the editor of the OED at the time actually wrote uh, to a consultant who was the, the professor of medicine at Oxford asking about these words. And he said, well, no, no, no one will ever use these. These are too technical. You can keep them out. And then a few years later, when the coronation of uh, King Edward had to be delayed because he had appendicitis and had to have an appendectomy, people looked at the OED and said, well, you don't have these words in. You know, what's wrong with you? Uh, so it's very hard to predict what's going to become prominent and why. Uh, all you can do is you know, use your best judgment for what's uh, common enough to be put in. Are there any English words that are used in your language? Yes, uh, for example, hamburger. It's used, I think, worldwide, but in Poland we say hamburger. Uh, yes, maybe computer. In Poland, computer. There are plenty of words like that. Plenty of words that uh, are about cuisine. Hot dog, hot dog in Polish. Oh, really, plenty of words like that. Do you think it would be better to use your own words? No, I don't think so, because uh, they're, they're used everywhere in this world, and why not in Poland? Are there any English words that are used in your language? Um, yes. I like... Uh, well, no, they're not... They're, they're, I don't think there are a lot of English words, but they are French words that sound English, like parking, which actually doesn't make sense in English. <laughs> but uh, it's a car park, and we call it parking. And it's not French at all, but um, we have a lot of things like that, <laughs> because English is cool. And so we try to make, <laughs> to make our words sound English, yeah. Do you think it would be better to use your own words? No. No, it's... We should, it's, I like the idea that there are words that you can, yeah, understand in every in every country. It makes us it brings nations, people closer, you know. Are there any English words that are used in your language? Uh, an English word that's used in Italian language. Oh, everything to do with technology. Everything to do with, with the internet and the internet itself. Well, someone could argue that internet is actually Latin, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, say download. We say we, we, we've given up saying the Italian version of downloading, which is scaricare, and most people just go with downloadare, which sounds very odd to the Italian ear, but we, we're going with it. Do you think it would be better to use your own words? I don't think it's necessary to, to set off on a crusade to defend the language in so much as, you know, as specific areas which are just the, the, the domain of another language. In Italian is the main domain in, in saying music. No one complains around the world because you say pianissimo when you have to play softly. Are there any English words that are used in your language? Too many, too many, I must say, yeah. It's, uh, we, we forget a lot of German words and replace them by English words. And, uh, I mean, they are pronounced in the same way. I, I miss that because I, I like Spanish as well, and they have so many, they have, like, words for computer or skateboard and things like that, which we don't have, and we take all the English words. And if there are new inventions or stuff like that, we don't invent new words, we just take them, and I think it's a pity not to, to do the opposite. Do you think it would be better to use your own words? It's, it's part of culture, and I think we should maintain that uh, you can't be op 
can be open to, to other languages and, and cultures, but at the same time you should keep your own one, I think.